Good morning, beloved children of God, and welcome to the Boulder City United Methodist Church Service of Worship. Friends, we are an inclusive church. It doesn't matter what your background has been or what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or your ethnicity, and it doesn't matter who you love. What does matter is that there is a God who loves you deeply, and this God desires to have a wonderful relationship with you. So, as we worship God this morning, let's make sure that we give God our best. Amen. And now I hope you have your candle ready as we light the Christ candle to remind us the presence of Christ is with us through this time of worship and always. Join with me now in our call to worship. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what hopes do you bring to worship? We bring hope for health and wholeness. What afflictions do you bring to worship? Physical pain from illness and injury. Emotional pain from sadness and scary life situations. Mental pain from dis-ease of many kinds. With all of these afflictions, it's a miracle that any of us has made it to worship this morning. But where else would we be? We yearn to know God's powerful love and to know that wholeness is possible. In today's gospel, a person with an afflicting spirit interrupts Jesus, and Jesus frees him. And where does the miracle of his story and our stories begin? When we bring all who, of who we are, hopeful, afflicted, bold, into relationship with the divine. So, come, let us enter the, his sanctuary with our whole selves, hopeful, afflicted, and bold. Come, let us worship. And now, join with me in our opening prayer. Almighty and most merciful God, we give thanks that you know us and love us. Help us, through the power of your Holy Spirit, grow deeper, wider, and fuller in our knowledge and understanding of your ways. Help us, through the bestowal of your divine wisdom, bring others closer to you and to your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, our sermon series, Follow Me, continues today with What Do You Have to Do With Us? And this is based on the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Hear now these words. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. And may the church here at the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us this morning. When we look at Mark's gospel, we find that it's very fast-paced. It gets right to the point, right at the very start. The good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, goes right then through John's baptism, baptizing people, right to Jesus' baptism. Jesus goes right into the desert, the wilderness, to experience temptation, gets ministering from the angels. And then Jesus goes right out into the Galilee area, uh, talking about the kingdom of God, preaching the good news. And then we, we go to the part where Jesus begins to collect his disciples. So it's all fast-paced. In fact, there is a, a word in the Greek which translates immediately throughout the Gospel of Mark, and it occurs 42 times. So Mark wants us to get on board right away with what's happening with Jesus in his, and his ministry, to know that he is indeed the Son of God, even though when we read throughout the Gospel, even the disciples have a hard time with that, as do other people. But we need to get on board with it. We need to get on board with it. So there's a sense of urgency there. 
So two weeks ago was the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And of course, yes, we are assured, yes, Jesus is indeed good, someone good who came out of Nazareth. Now there's a different question. What do you have to do with us, Jesus? So these are the words that come out of a man who has been listening to Jesus teach in the synagogue at this time. It's an interesting question that maybe we ask ourselves whenever we're sitting there listening to someone who's trying to make a point about something. Well, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with me? So we find Jesus teaching in a synagogue. And a synagogue is a place where Jewish people go to worship. The synagogues got started probably during the time of the exile, as some scholars point out. Remember that Babylon had totally destroyed Jerusalem. It leveled the temple. So there was no more of a place for the Jewish people to go to bring grain and food offerings. There was no place to go to bring animals for sacrifice. What were they to do? They they knew that they needed to to, uh, remember the Sabbath. So gatherings started. Synagogue started. That's what synagogue literally means, gathering of people. So they gathered to hear. They gathered to to, uh, hear whatever uh, scriptures are being read. At that time, they gather, gather to offer prayers. And no doubt some of these prayers ask for forgiveness since they no longer could get forgi- forgiveness through the offering of animals. Now, some scholars also think that perhaps the synagogue started during the time of Moses. The law, the law commanded that the Sabbath was to be observed. So one way of observing that was to go to a place, perhaps somewhere in the encampment, and they would offer prayers They would offer blessings to God and they would hear stories of their ancestors of that time while being Abraham and Sarah, Jacob, Isaac, Joseph. And maybe someone there would be expounding on those scriptures. So, people needed to feel connected with God and and by doing that, they gathered together on the Sabbath. They had to change. They had to change, make a change. Just like we've had to make a change ever since last March when the pandemic started to overwhelm the country. And now we find ourselves worshiping online. So in Capernaum today, you can see the remains of a synagogue made of white stone that was built in the 4th century. You can walk around it. You can sit on a bench on the side. You can go to where the rabbi might have stood and proclaimed whatever scriptures that he was preaching from. Uh, You can stand in the center and maybe pretend that you are one of those who are listening uh, to the rabbi or maybe even to Jesus. But from the rabbi's point of view, as you look out, you can see these buildings across the way and those are homes from the first century. And one of those places is where the disciples lived and where Jesus took up residence. But underneath that um, fourth century synagogue is another layer, a foundation of a synagogue that was built in the first century, a time from Jesus. So we're pretty sure that if you go there today and you stand in that area, that you were standing in the same place that Jesus was teaching in this particular time or any time he was teaching there. So, also, it's just a short walk from the community to get there. But not every synagogue had a rabbi to hold Sabbath services. There was a clergy shortage. With all the synagogues, all the gatherings around the Holy Land, it was hard that each uh, synagogue could have a rabbi, and maybe some rabbis itinerated. Of course, we know Jesus itinerated. So usually the community would pick some man, at that time it was a man, to uh, come and lead the community in the Sabbath worship. So Mark tells us that Jesus went to Capernaum. And Jesus picked that spot in Capernaum more than likely because it was a very important city. It was the center of the Galilean fishing industry. And Capernaum also had a garrison of Roman soldiers. So a very important place for Jesus to really focus on some ministry. So on this particular Sabbath that Mark describes, Jesus is invited to to lead the faith community in prayers, blessings, readings from the law and the prophets, um, and then give an exposition on those readings to explain the lesson to the people. 
And perhaps Jesus was even teaching about what, what he means by um, the uh, kingdom of God is here and now, that, that your sins are forgiven without having to go to the second temple uh, to make offerings. That God is present here and now. Sins are forgiven and, and the invitation to change, repent. That this is important in the midst of this grace that is coming down from God on this world. So since we're dealing with a question again, Keith Giles writes in, in, an, an, in an article, are we and it's from a, a website, patheos.com. He, he shares this. He says, I recently heard Todd Hunter remark that modern American Christianity has reduced the gospel to a question that never appears in the Bible. You know the one. It goes something like this. If you knew for sure that you would die tonight, do you know that you'd be in heaven tomorrow? Have you ever been asked that question? I've been asked that question. Hunter suggests that if we're really going to be true to the gospel of the kingdom and the philosophy of Jesus, we need to ask this question. If you knew for sure you'd be alive tomorrow, who would you follow and how would you live your life? You see the difference between the two questions? So, continues. After all, most of us will not be dead tomorrow. We'll be alive. What we need is a gospel for everyday life. The life we find ourselves living is precisely where we need Jesus to rule and reign in his way. The true gospel involves daily taking up a cross, our cross, following Jesus. It is the gospel for life, not just for a day that we die. And what makes me the most upset is the idea that I've wasted so many years of my walk with Jesus focused on the wrong things. To think that I've lived most of my Christian life based on the answer to the wrong question, all this time I thought of Jesus as my Savior, but not as my Lord. And yet, if he is not one, he cannot be the other. Difference between Savior and Lord, just a, a quick note here. We know that Jesus brings us salvation, brings us one with God. Lord means that Jesus is our master who we follow. The master who we follow. So the fellow continues, All this time, I've missed the simple truth that Jesus calls me to surrender my life to him and trade in my own empty kingdom for the eternal kingdom of God. All this time. So, while Jesus is teaching about the scriptures that were read at that time, perhaps there are shouts of amen and hallelujah because, according to the scriptures, Jesus taught with authority, not like the scribes taught. I can only imagine maybe some scribes had the opportunity, being men in the community, to come and give an explanation of scriptures, and, and maybe all he got were yawns. But Jesus, he was empowered to preach and teach with the Holy Spirit. And so he goes and he's going on and on about how God is for us. And within the midst of all these shouts of amens and all of that, another voice begins to shout, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Now, certainly God is out to destroy anything that threatens the kingdom. God is not out to destroy what God is trying to create. There is always, it seems, a battle between good and evil. The goodness of loving relationships, the treatment of all people, of a peace that surpasses all understanding, bringing justice, ending oppression, and putting self right with God, again, goes up against evil. The evils of war, injustice, oppression, racism, sexism, or any kind of ism. We don't know the status of the man's unclean spirit. We don't know what happened in his life. And we really can't bring our psychoanalysis of the 21st century back on first century people. It's, we just can't do that. Perhaps his life got so twisted up that he was no longer living in the image of God. Something happened to him. Maybe he suffered an accident. Maybe he suffered from poverty. 
broken relationship that led him to a broken relationship with God. But because he's in the synagogue, maybe he's trying to get better somehow. So every Sabbath, this man goes to the synagogue to find hope and he comes up short. But this Sabbath, something is different with this man, Jesus. And in his struggle that day, this man with an unclean spirit who might have been afraid to change what was going on in his life, what would it mean to change? So the man challenges Jesus. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Remember how important it is to know someone's name or deity's name in the Bible? Knowing the name of the deity or person gives power to the one who is naming. So the man with the unclean spirit makes an attempt to thwart Jesus' challenge of changing one's life in the kingdom of God. However, Jesus is a step ahead. Jesus rebukes the man and calls that unclean spirit to come out of the man. And so we get the convulsing and the screaming and all that, and the man is healed. Jesus is stronger than any unclean spirit. So the people who witness this episode, they're amazed. No one has been able to help this man before. Jesus teaches with authority that they've never seen. And it is a higher authority than even the scribes. So again, maybe the scribes, maybe they tried to help the man, but maybe their maybe they're, they're training included pastoral care, but they just couldn't make it work for this guy. But Jesus demonstrates through action, through action, not just talking about God's kingdom, but demonstrating through action that people's lives can be healed. It's all about salvation. Salvation. In 1965, a chemist named Stephanie Kolek was working in one of DuPont's labs. And her group was trying to create a new polymer fiber, light but also strong, that could be woven into sheets and used to replace the heavy woven steel bands used to make car tires. In the lab, Kolek would dissolve long chains of molecules of the same type of synthetic materials that used to make nylon. And she would then run the resulting solution through a machine that spun the thickened mixture into a fiber. And one effort resulted in a milky solution that bore little resemblance to the syrup-like concoctions that she had been working with. She nearly discarded the batch as uncomprising, but then, on a whim, decided to send it to be tested. And the result was the strongest, thickest fiber anyone has ever seen. Colwack had just invented Kevlar a material five times stronger than steel, but much lighter. And Kevlar has multiple of multitude of practical applications. It's used to manufacture heads for snare drums, mooring lines for ship, uh, cables for suspension bridges, and lightweight canoes. And it's best known, of course, for its role in manufacturing of bulletproof vets and body armor. You know all those movies when you see someone shot and they're down there and for some reason they always have to open their jacket or shirt to show that, oh yeah, I've got a vest that stopped the bullets. I don't know why they have to open their shirts. But anyway, for some, these garments are quite literally garments of salvation. So, salvation. God looked at the world. We needed help. We can get stuck in our lives. We can get twisted up as well. We push people away. We sink further and further and further into self. Salvation was needed. So, in the way that a salve is used to heal a wound like Neosporin, Jesus comes into this world by the grace of God to help our lives be healed, to help whatever rifts we had with God to come together and be healed. So God wants everyone, each and every one of us, to be whole, to be healed from whatever ails us. And that, again, could be broken relationships, suffering from oppression and injustice. It could be physical ailments, suffering from economic woes, and, and even suffering from this pandemic. Last spring, Rebecca Solnit wrote, quote, the impossible has already happened What coronavirus can teach us about hope 
And this was in last spring's The Guardian. And she writes this. When a caterpillar enters its chrysalis, it dissolves itself, quite literally, into liquid. And in this state, what was a caterpillar will be a butterfly, is neither one nor the other. It's a living soup. Within this living soup are the imaginal cells that will catalyze its transformation into wing maturity. And may the best among us, the most visionary, the most inclusive, be the imaginal cells. For we are now in a soup, in the soup. The outcomes of disasters is not foreordained. It's a conflict, one, that can take place while things were frozen, solid, and locked up, have become open and fluid, full of the both best and worst possibilities. We are both becalmed and in a stage right now of profound change. But this time that we find ourselves now is a time of death for those spending more time at home and more time alone, looking outward at this unanticipated world. We often divide emotions into good and bad, happy and sad, but I think they can be equally divided into shallow and deep, and the pursuit of what is supposed to be happiness is often a flight from depth and from one's own interior life and the suffering around us. And not being happy is often framed as failure. But there is meaning as well as pain and sadness, mourning, grief, and the emotions born of empathy and solidarity. If you are sad and frightened, it is a sign that you care, that you are connected in spirit. If you are overwhelmed, well, it is overwhelming. And it will take decades of study, analysis, discussion, and contemplation to understand how and why 2020 suddenly took us all into a marshy new territory. The man with the unclean spirit was in marshy territory in his life. He was stuck. Our lives have been impacted by COVID-19 in many ways, and maybe even in some ways yet to be discovered. What does Jesus have to do with us? Jesus continues to work in and through each and every one of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every day we are invited to open our eyes to the miracles of God's kingdom in this world here and now that unfold before us and even in this time of pandemic. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, Paul writes, As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the, time, the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found, found, found within our ministry. But as the servants of God, we are commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hungers by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are all known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. So this is Paul speaking about what's going on in his life to that church in Corinth. That, yeah, bad stuff can happen in our lives. And we can cry out, what are you having to do with us? The answer is that Jesus is with us. It is through him that we can endure all those things that Paul just listed. We can. We can do it. So we are not the first generation of Christians to experience deep struggles. And when our lives are transformed by the grace of our Lord Jesus, we have the salvation that strengthens us to face anything. Whether it is facing something personal or facing, some, facing something that is on behalf of others, we have the strength to endure. 
So what does Jesus have to do with us? Jesus strengthens us and guides us each and every day of our lives for the sake of the kingdom that we may show that in our lives, the kingdom is here and now. Amen. And now times it's, friends, it's now time for our virtual offering. And thank you for your continued generosity toward your church and toward God. Let us now offer a prayer for the offerings that we will receive during this week. O God of power and wisdom, we give you our eternal thanks for the gift of your Son, who came not only to save but to teach us about your kingdom and how we might live, readying ourselves for that kingdom. He taught with authority. And if we listen, we will live a life of generosity, mercy, and compassion. Bless what we, what we give this day and through the week and help us be faithful in the use of all our resources that we might live like those anticipating your kingdom. In Christ we pray. Amen. Passion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God. Now, friends, it's time for us to uh, go into a time of prayer and to prepare hearts for this moment. Let's now sing, Come and Find the Quiet Center. Come and find the quiet center In the crowded life we lead Find the room for hope to frame where we are freed. Clear the chaos and the 
What have we done? We want to praise you, so we splash your words on television screens, on the wall, with brightly colored and powerful images. We shout your praises with our hands held high. We teach and preach your word, but we don't listen carefully for you. We're so busy trying to shout above the noise of the day that we don't take time to really listen and know you. The voices of the prophets spoke to people long ago were too busy and anxious to hear. Their words streamed in the winds of time and have come to us. And we need to pay attention to your message offered through all of them. You are our God, the God of all creation, the God of power and love, whose mercy is offered to us. In Jesus' time, he proclaimed the good news through words and actions, reaching out to those who were troubled, alienated cast aside. He offered healing and hope to those others turned away. O God, at this time, we do lift up to you our families, our friends, those on our prayer list who are in need of healing, that you would reach and touch their lives, help them to be healed and whole once again. We ask as well that you help us to learn that you alone can heal us and fix those areas in our lives that are wounded and twisted. Help us to understand that you alone can offer us a new way of life through Jesus Christ. Remind us again that we have spoken the names of peoples and situations that concern us, praying for your healing touch. That touch is offered to us in Jesus' name. Lord, We need to let go of our control issues and place our trust wholly in you, now and forever. As we lift up this prayer in the name of Jesus, who with you and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, forever and ever, and who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In the Spirit, let us travel open to each other's pain. Let our loves and fears unravel, celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for deepest dreaming, there's a time for heart to care. In the Spirit's lively scheming, there is all. Friends, as we close our service now, a reminder. Jesus has come into the world to teach us and help us in our daily living to show the kingdom of God is here and now. So no matter what ails us, whatever we experience, we can get through it because of our Lord Jesus. So while that's happening in your life, make sure that you laugh a lot. Make sure that you have as much fun as you can this side of the galaxy, that you enjoy life, that you live in Christ, that you are at peace, that you go in peace. Have a blessed week.